You can't mix the Old Testament law and the New Testament grace. These two different covenants don't come together to make one new covenant. No, the Old Testament law has been replaced with the New Testament grace. There is no combination of the two. We're going to explain that today, so stay tuned for the Gospel Truth. Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that emphasizes God's unconditional love and grace. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Wednesday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today I'm continuing our series on the true nature of God. And again, I'd like to say that we have covered some powerful teaching in this, things that are totally different than what most people have heard, and yet I've backed up everything I'm saying by Scripture. I don't know how people can complain about this. It's just things that we have uh, willingly ignored. We, most people don't let the Word of God get in the way of their theology. They base their theology on what tradition has said. This is what most people do, and so they just follow that, and they don't really scrutinize the Scripture. But I tell you, the Scripture, I've been teaching things that are very plain. I hadn't got time to go back over that. And I also want to remind you that this coming Friday is going to be my last day to make this new material that I've got on the true nature of God available. I, had, I used to have a three-part series on that. Now I've turned it into a five-part series. It's new and improved, expanded. So Friday will be my last day to offer that to you. And so I want to encourage you to please go to the effort of requesting these materials. I just really believe it's important to get this truth out. And even though you've watched the programs, the programs in itself isn't the product. Uh, I can't go into the depth that I do on a CD or a cassette tape because it's broken into little 30-minute segments and people don't watch this every day. And even if you do watch this program every day, there's a lot of things that happen in between my last program and this program and uh, there's just things that you forget and it's hard to connect all of the dots. So I really believe that this product is essential. If you want to get this teaching and understand the things that I've been talking about, about us being redeemed from the law, you need these teachings. It's really important. So we've been talking about the nature of God. I've shown that the Old Testament law gave people a wrong impression of God. Not that the Old Testament law was wrong, but it's been interpreted wrong. And we forget that the Old Testament law wasn't God's first way of dealing with mankind, nor has it been His way of dealing with mankind since the days of Jesus. Now, those are two radical statements, and I've spent quite a bit of time explaining that, but that's exactly what the Bible teaches. We were reading on our last program in Galatians chapter 3. I just want to keep reading here in Galatians chapter 4 some of these scriptures that will make these truths very evident. In verse 1 it says, Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all. And you know, uh, the servant here, it's literally talking about a slave. Not just an employee or somebody who works for you, but he's talking about a slave. That's what the term means, and this was written back in a day and time when uh, a servant was a slave. So this is comparing... Uh, uh, the children of God under the law to being like slaves. You didn't have any rights or privileges. You were just a child and you couldn't exercise your full authority and do things. You were no different than a slave. In verse 2 it says, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore, thou art no more a servant or slave, but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ." And so this is saying that when we come into the new covenant and you get born again, you become an heir of God, a joint heir with God is what it says in Romans chapter 8. We are heirs together with Christ, joint heirs. And we are no longer children. In a sense, a child 
has to be restrained, have the restrictions put on them, punishments, all kinds of restrictions and things to hold them in check. But when you become an, an adult and you're the heir, did you know that now you're on your own and you aren't under those same tutors and governors? You know, I remember some of my teachers that were very strict back when I was in grade school. And you know what? As long as I was under them, when I was a child, they had authority over me and I had to respect them. I had to revere them. Even if I felt they were wrong, you know what? They had authority over me. But now I'm older and I'm an adult and of course many of them have died and gone on. But I know that there's one of my teachers that wrote me, saw me on television, and now I would come unto them. It's a totally different relationship. I wouldn't be under their authority. They couldn't exercise the same authority. They couldn't punish me if I got out of line. They couldn't do those things to me today because I'm an adult. Well, it's the same way. Under the old covenant law, before we were born again, before people could be born again under the old covenant, they were kept under all of these rules and bondages and restrictions. But now that they become born again, and now that we are in Christ then the law shouldn't be holding that kind of effect over us. There has been a difference. And this is what it goes on to say in uh, Galatians chapter 5. It says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. You know what that yoke of bondage is that it's talking about? It's talking about the Old Testament law. It's just amazing to me. There are literally, I mean hundreds and hundreds of New Testament scriptures that show that the Old Testament law was temporary. It was only until the time of Christ that the Old Testament law had weaknesses in it, inadequacies in it, so God brought in a better covenant. He has disannulled the previous covenant of law. It is ready to vanish away. It was to strengthen sin. It was to kill. It was to condemn. It was to sh shut your mouth, to make you guilty, to make sin come alive, to give lust an opportunity against you. All of these scriptures are saying that the law is over. This is not the way that God deals with us. And if you can understand that and understand that the law never was intended for us, really, it never was God's best. He didn't give it to Adam and Eve. He waited 2,000 years and as soon as possible he brought his son and once his son has come, he suspended the law. The Old Testament law is not how he wants us to relate to him. If you could see these truths in Scripture, you know what it would do? It would change your impression of the nature and the character of God. And that's what I've been trying to do. God has been misrepresented. Yes, there's things that he's done, commandments that he gave in Scripture that are harsh and judgmental, but it was given for a specific reason for only a brief period of time, and that was not the true nature and character of God. You know, there are so many ways I could illustrate this. Let me just... Take an example over here. In John chapter 8, they brought a woman in front of Jesus who was taken in the very act of adultery. And they threw her down in front of Jesus and they said unto him, and this is in John chapter 8 and verse 4, they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? And I think I've already made reference to this at the very beginning of this teaching, so I won't go into the long explanation. But what they were trying to do was to trap Jesus. He had been preaching that God is a merciful God. And so what the Jews did was take a commandment of God that didn't show mercy, but instead said that if a person commits adultery, stone him to death. And so they trapped this woman in adultery. It's my personal opinion that the man who committed adultery with this woman was probably planted there by the Pharisees. They probably paid him to go into this prostitute and have sex with her. And the reason I say that is because they only brought the woman. They didn't bring the man. If they were really after justice, if she was taken in the very act of adultery, that means that the guy had to be present. But see, they weren't after justice. They just were trying to entrap Jesus. And they brought the woman because people would have more sympathy and pity towards a woman than they would a man. So they brought the woman and threw her down in front of Jesus and they thought they had Jesus. Because if he stoned her to death the way that the commandment of God said you had to do, 
than all of the people who were attracted to him because he was preaching mercy instead of law and judgment would leave. But if he didn't stone her to death, then they could stone him to death because that's what the scripture says. You either stone them to death or you get stoned. You break the law of God and therefore you bear the punishment. So they had the problem fixed, it looked like. They were either going to ruin his reputation and the people would leave him, or if he didn't stone her to death, they could stone him to death. So they thought they had Jesus any way he went. But of course, the wisdom of God, he was able to outsmart them, and he said, he that's without sin cast the first stone. He didn't say that she wasn't a sinner. He didn't say that she didn't deserve death. He didn't contradict the Old Testament law. He just said, let those of you that are without sin stone her. And they all left being convicted of their own conscience. And, but, but the whole logic behind this is, see, they saw this apparent conflict between the Old Testament law, the wrath, the judgment, the harshness, the anger against sin, and the mercy and the grace that Jesus was portraying God to be. They saw the apparent conf conflict between that. I know that there's some people who are sitting here saying, well, I don't see that God... You know, they're, they're trying to mix to merge the New Testament love with the Old Testament law and say, no, God is a loving God who still hates sin and does all these things. Well, I believe that God hates sin, but he doesn't hate the sinner. God is not a God of wrath. There is a difference between the way God released his, his power in the Old Covenant versus the way he does it in the New Covenant, and the two cannot mix. They are incompatible. And that's what we've got to see. And that's the reason I've been bringing these things out, trying to portray what the true nature and character of God is. So the Old Testament law really portrayed God one way. The New Testament grace portrays him in a different way. And some people just haven't seen this conflict because, again, religion has tried to mix the New Testament grace with the Old Testament law and say that God does all of these things. No, they are different covenants, different ways of God dealing with people. Here's another passage of Scripture that makes this same point. This is Jesus speaking. He was being criticized by the scribes and the Pharisees and in the defense of himself, he said this in Mark chapter 2. It says, No man also soweth a piece of new cloth on an old garment, else the new piece that filleth it up, taketh away from the old, and the rent is made worse. And no man putteth new wine into old bottles, else the new wine doth burst the bottles, and the wine is spilled, and the bottles will be marred, but new wine must be put into new bottles. Now some people just look at this and they say, what is all this about? It's just using the illustration. If you had a shirt that had a hole in it, and if you went to patch it, you can't patch it with a new, unshrunk patch because the old garment has already been washed. It's already stretched or shrunk or, or I, I don't even know how all this works, but the new garment is already shrunk. So, uh, I mean, the old garment is already shrunk. So it won't shrink anymore. But that new garment, that new patch that you put on it when you uh, laundry it, it will shrink, it'll shrivel up a little bit, and when it does, since the old, pat, the old garment won't give any more, it'll just make the tear bigger. That's the point that he's making. And then when he talked about putting new wine into new bottles, the point that he's making is that wine ferments, and these old wine skins that they used to put them in, they, were, they had a little bit of elasticity, I think is the way you say it, and be, you know, when they were new, but then after a while they harden up and they become kind of brittle, and if you were to put new wine in there that started fermenting and expanding once again, the bottles just can't expand anymore and what it would do is break them. So the point is that you can't put something new into the old garment. You can't put new wine into an old bottle or the point that he's really making is that you can't mix the new covenant and the old covenant. They are as incompatible as a new patch on an old garment or new wine in an old bottle. You can't put the new covenant and the old covenant together and make one new thing out of them and say we're going to serve God by both of these, the New Testament grace plus the Old Testament law. That's exactly what these verses are saying. 
I know that some people say, well, this isn't what I've been taught. I just can't accept this. Well, this is what the Bible teaches. This is what Jesus taught. This is the reason that Jesus was persecuted. And brothers and sisters, if Jesus was here in his physical body on this earth so that we could hear him speak without having to go through a person like me, and if he was able to speak and act without any loss of interpretation going through people, Jesus would be persecuted by the religious church today just as much as he was persecuted by the scribes and the Pharisees of the days in the New Testament because the religious church today is legalistic. It is holding people's sins unto them, telling them that if they don't do all of these things, God won't bless them, that the reason they've got tragedy in their life is because God is judging their sin and on and on. And Jesus wouldn't be preaching that message he would be countering the legalism that is existing in his quote-unquote church today. And I don't think he'd last three and a half years today the way that he did back in the days of the scribes and the Pharisees. Somebody would shoot him, kill him, get away with do away with him quicker today than they did back then. I know that's a startling statement to some of you, and some of you think, oh, no, that's not so. The church, I believe that we're much better than that. I believe that we're accurately representing God. Well, again, there are individual churches that are. There's some wonderful churches that I go to. But you know what? I'm saying that the church as a whole, as a body, is misrepresenting God. And I might as well throw this in because I'm probably already upset a lot of people. I might as well get it all out of the way so that you'll all get upset at one time. But I'm not only talking about the denominational church or something like that. Did you know that the charismatic, spirit-filled, Pentecostal, tongue-talking, full gospel church that I consider myself to be more of that flavor because I believe in miracles and baptism of the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues and all of these things. Did you know that that segment of the church, of the body of Christ, I believe that we're all one body even though we differ on these doctrines, but that Pentecostal charismatic segment of the body of Christ has become just as legalistic, just as dead as any of the denominational churches. Now again, there's individual churches that are different, but there's individual denominational churches that are different. Man, I know some Baptist churches that are turned on, and Methodists and Pente uh, uh, Presbyterians and all of those. There's individual churches in any of those groups that are really excited about God and flowing with what God is doing. But there's Pentecostal charismatic churches that are deader than a hammer. Man, my good friend Dave Duell tells a story about going into a church and preaching and a person died and they called 911 and the emergency people came and they took out half of the congregation before they found the dead person. <laughs> you know what? There are some churches that are that dead. But the good news is, what this means is, in each one of those churches... I believe that there are God-fearing people, people that love God with all of their heart, and they aren't being fed. They know that there's something more. They know that the religious system, the way it's being presented today and the way it's functional, that this can't be true Christianity. And I see a hunger in the body of Christ that exists today that I haven't seen since back in the early 60s. And that's the way that it was right before the charismatic move came. And I mean revival hit and wonderful things happen. It's in a sense like, you know, I was out riding horses yesterday in Colorado and it was just beautiful. We got one of the greenest years that we've ever had. The, the grass was up three and four feet high. And I mean, it's just lush in Colorado. We got a great year. But back in 2002, we had a drought going and I mean, it was dry, and everything was so, uh, uh, you know, so dry that I mean, I have to burn my trash out where I live because I live way out in the country, and I burn the grass right around my trash barrels as a fire break. And I remember back during the, uh, the drought of 2002 when we had some huge fires come through there, I would take little bits of fire and I'd put them to that grass to burn it up so that you no know, sparks had come out and started on fire. And I mean, you could just touch a match to one of those uh, clumps of grass and it would explode. Boom! It wouldn't just burn, it would explode. It was so dry. The other day I was burning trash and I put some 
a fire out there trying to burn some grass that had grown up, and it wouldn't even burn. It was so wet. I mean, I had to hold it there and just kind of singe the grass. It wouldn't burn. Well, in a sense, I see that the way it was in the early 60s, people were so sick of the denominational church and recognized there must be something more, and they were looking for something more. And the established, traditional, mainline church just wasn't feeding people, and there was a hunger and a desire among the people. I was one of them that made us just like tinder that was ready to go up in flames at any moment. And when the spark of that charismatic revival hit, man, it took off. You know, I see it the same way today. There are people hungry, looking for something more. They're tired of all the rules and the regulations. And again, the charismatic, Pentecostal, full gospel realm that was birthed in revival has become as rigid and as dead and as lifeless as the groups that they came out of. And I guarantee you there are some flaky things going on. You know, I'm not going to mention any names or names of the networks or anything, but yesterday I turned on television and watched some Christian television just to see what was out there. And you know what? It's embarrassing. There was people screaming and yelling and pumping the people up. You haven't heard me. And people were running and shouting. And I watched for 20 minutes and there wasn't a thing said. There wasn't anything done or said. It was just religious people getting worked up into a lather and doing all of these things. And you know what? There are people that that's all they see. That's all they have. That's all they're exposed to. And because of it, they're hungry. They're dry. They're ready for a revival. And I really believe with all of my heart that God is using not only me but other people, but that God is raising up people that are beginning to say some of these truths and explain about why there was a harshness and a wrath from God in the old covenant, but how that under the new covenant we aren't living under that law. God isn't imputing our sins unto us. There are people that are hungry and ready to hear this and being set free. And I believe that what I've been saying on these programs is just like a spark that is going to ignite and it's going to spread like wildfire. And I believe that people are going to start seeing and understanding the goodness of God. And I pray that you're one of them. You know, again, I just want to make a pitch for these materials that we're offering. This Friday is going to be my last day to offer those materials. And I really believe that this teaching on the nature of God, the true nature of God, is one of those things that could provide the spark that just could ignite you and help you to see the goodness and the grace of God. It could transform your relationship with God. You cannot have a good, positive relationship with a person that you have misunderstood and who's been misrepresented and maligned in your presence. You've got to find out the truth and find out the true nature of a person to have a healthy relationship with them. And we need a readjustment, a re-education of ourselves about what is God really like. And I believe that this teaching is going to help accomplish that in your life. 